right, well, hey, everyone, my name is Don. If we haven't had the chance to meet, my wife and I, Jamie, get the pastor, hi, Mark, and it's such an honor and a privilege. And if you're new to Highmark, hey, we want to say welcome home. We pray this is a place that feels like home. And I just want to give a shout out to you and all of us join, all of those joining us online today. We're so glad that you're with us. And so uh, everyone in the house today, let's give it up for the new people and those joining us online. Come on, be loud, be proud. Okay, work on that next week, okay? Come a little more fired up, okay? That's your part. We need you. We need you in that part. So today, we're kicking off a series called More Than Enough, and we're looking at really, uh, throughout this series, God's principles and uh, around our finances. We're looking at uh, how God has uh, laid out our, our world and, and challenges us to uh, realize that he is our supply. He is the one we can depend on. He is the one that uh, we, we can call upon. And, and we, everything we have comes from him. And so we're going to look at while that, why that is and what the Bible says about money. And the Bible actually talks about money at great length. You know, a lot of times people get frustrated uh, about the church talking about money, and I I just want to let you know, we do this series once a year. Uh, If you're new with us or checking us out, this is an every week thing, Uh, but we do take uh, one time a year where we do a series focused on this because the Bible uh, talks about it enough that it's important for us to dig into and really understand And I always, like, since we've started Highmark, it's like, hey, we want to preach and teach the entire Word of God. And if we were to avoid that topic and just not want to step on toes, then it might just, like, we would not be teaching the full Word of God. And so we're committed to that. Uh, The Bible talks at length about it. And I always like to let people know, like... Hey, as a church, we're strong. Our finances are strong. Like God has provided. I even shared in our annual report last year, like obviously our giving, uh, our, our, our expenses went up just like they've probably gone up in your, in your household, in your home. Uh, but as a church, our giving went up and it met, just met that uh, increase. But so our finances are strong, but we always know there's more. We're a church with a big vision. We know that God can use us and, and we, we want to make an impact on the world. We want to partner with more, with more missionaries. We want to be able to support more ministries here locally and make a difference in our community. And so, uh, you know, we just know there's more that we can do to reach more people and make a difference. And so, uh, I just like to kind of let people know that, you know, and, and we're just committed to a healthy approach when it comes to our finances and with money as a church. And, and so we teach about it. We talk about it. Uh, we try to take the stigma, stigma off of it because, you know, I think sometimes even one of the most misquoted scriptures is that, you know, the Bible says that, like, people say, you know, we shouldn't love money. You shouldn't talk about money or anything like that. And, and it says that, you know, money is the root of all evil. That's probably the most misquoted scripture because actually the Bible says it's the love of money that becomes the root of all evil. And so uh, money is actually a tool. It's a tool that you use to live your life. It's a tool that the church and the body of Christ uses to build the kingdom of God. And, and that's the purpose behind it. And, and so we practice, when we talk about money, I want you to know as a church, since day one of Highmark Church, we practice what we preach, okay? Here's what I mean. We believe that the Bible teaches tithing. I'll get into more uh, in that in this, throughout the series and today a little bit. But uh, we believe the Bible teaches uh, for us to tithe. And as a church, we do that very same thing. So uh, every dollar, every you know, gift that comes in, we give 10% of it to missionaries and ministries around the world that are making a difference. So, you know, you can have a confidence that you are making a global impact with every dollar that comes in. And we have purposed to give away and, and demonstrate the tithe even in our, our budget as a church. And so, and let me tell you, uh, that is a conviction we've had from day one. We, we hold to it. We look at it every year. We, we increase the amount. Uh, we've been able to support more and more missionaries that way. And so thank you for being generous. Thank you for supporting the church. Thank you for being more than just being uh, generous. It's you're being obedient in tithing, and it's helping us 
uh, see God move around the world and right here in our own community. So, and I, I always like to say this, um, as the pastor, I don't work on commission sales, okay? So, um, you know, my, my salary and income is set by our overseers and our board of overseers, and that's their external, and they, you know, look at our budget. They set uh, a salary and income for uh, myself and our family to, to be able to continue to minister and, and lead the church, um, and, and it's not commission, you know? So it's not like, hey, you know, pastor's preaching this message because, you know, he, he needs it, you know, like, and, it, and it's pressure. Like, no, I'm not trying to take something from you today. I'm trying to give you something and help you understand what the Word of God is and the principles in the Word of God that will unlock, like, another level of God's, of, of trust in God in your life and you seeing God's hand move in your life. And so anyway, those are all of my like disclaimers. I always have to, I feel like I need to start the series with a bunch of disclaimers because I, I know, listen, I know, and I hear the things and I see them posted on Facebook and I see people like, you know, like the church is all about this and all about that. And let me tell you, like, as true as I can say it, like God has a principle when it comes to our finances And I just want you to grab hold of that and live that. And I want us as a church to be able to make the biggest impact that we can. I want us to be able to, you know, be part of changing the world. And, you know, in the reality, that takes time and that takes an investment from us as a church to to see that happen. And, And so thank you for being a part of that. And uh, let me get in the message now that I got all the disclaimers out of the way. Um, But we have to recognize, though, I kind of get this, like, uh, or, uh, let me add one more. As, like, as a church, we operate on an annual budget. So we have a budget. I know my wife's laughing at me right now because she's like, oh, one more disclaimer. But, um, you know, we operate on a, on, a, on a budget. So what comes in monthly, you know, we're, we're tracking all of those things. We have bookkeeping and, you know, all of those things. It's, you know, uh, to d- just, you know, have good accountability around it. And I will say that, like, you know, uh, we, our budget is guided a lot of times by like reoccurring giving. So uh, if you set up like a reoccurring giving, I know there's many people here at Highmark that do that. That's amazing. Thank you for doing that because it just helps us budget and know and expect like, okay, where should we be and, and things like that. So uh, thank God bless you. I just wanted to throw that in there and say thank you because it really helps us kind of steward well what God has entrusted to us. And uh, that's the thing that's scariest about being a pastor, if I'm all, if in all honesty, is like, if I'm not stewarding what God is doing in your life and in our church, and, and uh, if I'm not stewarding in uh, the finances of the church, then like, I, I feel like we're missing it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm scared about that. Like, I don't want God to get, get after me, you know? So, um, but here's what I want to go this morning. I want to talk about how we should look at our finances because I've really identified that, you know, the world around us, more than anything when it comes to finances and when it comes to uh, money, the world breeds discontentment. It just breeds it. It just wants us to be like, you know what? You don't have enough. You know what? There isn't, like, you could upgrade this, or look at what your neighbors have, like, uh, or I, you have to think that, like, all the marketing you see, they target you, you speak something, like, talking to a friend, and next thing you know, you're on social media, and there's an advertisement for it. You know, they're listening, they're targeting you, they're spending millions of dollars to try to get you to buy their product. And, real, and kind of come to the, the understanding or get to a place where you're like, I need this, even if you don't like need it. Or you might be saying, hey, I'm looking at my neighbors and what they drive. You know, I was laughing this week because I drove here into the church and coming into the office uh, this week and in the morning and, and pulling out of our driveway right here into the church, there were three Land Rovers right in a row. Like, and I, just three of them, and they all looked like brand new. Like, I was like, man, Maybe they're swinging by Highmark Church, like, uh, but I saw that, and I was like, 
man, look at that. I just thought, look at our community. Like, there's so many, like, uh, there, there's a, a lot of affluence, and it could be easy to look around and, and see what other people have and be like, I want that. Like, God, like, just give me that. Like, our prayers shift from, like, God, work on my heart to, like, Lord, bring the Land Rover, you know? Like, you know, like, just let me get that raise at work, you know? Uh, and, it's, and, it, and maybe our, our, our approach should be like, God, help us make a bigger impact. Help us to build the kingdom, Lord. Help us to give away more. Help me to help my neighbor that's struggling, Lord. Help me to, you know, like have compassion on the people around me. Help me to be positioned to be able to be generous in a moment when you prompt me instead of like us just pursuing like the next best thing and the thing that we can build. And, and ultimately, it's just built. Our world is built to make us feel dissatisfied with what we have. And the credit industry is 100,000% focused on you getting it now and then you being a slave to them to pay it off. And that, I think, just is all of these things combined have just created this fever pitch. And then uh, today, I, I, I think as we get into this message, I think that we know that there's some hesitancy of like what's coming up in the economy. We're not quite sure of what's going to take place. We're hearing reports of like, you know, companies doing mass layoffs and people losing their job. And uh, today we're going to look at, a, and the title of my message is called Recession Proof, because I want to help you shift your mindset to not say, hey, I'm stepping into this or I'm fearful of what's ahead and the I have insecurity around my finances, but I want you to get a hold of the biblical principles that will help us live secure regardless of what the economy does. And regardless of what Wall Street says is happening, God has another plan and another purpose and can work all things to the good. And uh, today I want to look at the principles and, and look at really how we can live content. And uh, I'm not saying that when I say like the message is like on recession proof, I'm not saying that like, uh, hey, if you give, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna feel the impacts of the economy. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that, you know, the, res uh, the worry that might come related to the economy and to what's happening and your job and all of those things, I'm saying that that can be alleviated. I'm saying that you don't have to live with this worry about those things, but you can live with the trust in God. And regardless of what circumstances you face and what trials you could face, that you can be faithful to what God calls you to do, and you can see God's blessing in the midst of it. One of my favorite scriptures when it comes to finances is Hebrews chapter 13. It says, don't love money, be satisfied with what you have, for God has said, I will never fail you, and I will never abandon you. Man, what a great reminder. Now, the writer of Hebrews is writing this to the, to the believers, and he's writing it because the believers are actually being persecuted, and, and for following Jesus, they're losing everything. Like, they're losing their jobs. They're losing their wealth. They're kind of being persecuted and ostracized. They're being, you know, uh, persecuted in this moment, and, and, and the writer of of Hebrews, which we're not sure if it's Peter, Paul, who knows, but uh, one of them wrote this and, and said, don't love money, but be satisfied for with what you have. So he's talking about living life content and, and that we can live life with a, a wholeness and a perspective that like regardless of how much or how little we have, that we can trust God and we realize that gaining Jesus is everything. You see, the, the, the believers here that they're writing to, they're gaining Jesus, but then they're losing everything. And you know what? In our culture, we don't have that same reality. We have, uh, we gain Jesus and we still gain, like we don't have that type of persecution where, where everything is taken away from us. Because so, so we can be, it can be for us, gain, gain. And here, he, it was a gain-loss, and either way that it goes, whether it's gain-gain or, or gain-loss, like, you can be content with what you have either way. 
And no, ma no matter if you become the wealthiest person in the world, like you, you still have to work out being content with what you have. So money isn't going to solve that heart issue. You just look at every like person that's won the lottery and their life just becomes a wasteland. There's like documentaries on those, you know, and it's like, you know, like something happened where they just, they were trying to satisfy their soul and, the, and they couldn't, they couldn't satisfy, they couldn't find the contentment in things. We can only find contentment in Jesus. And so this morning we're going to look at what Jesus taught about money. Matthew chapter six says this, uh, Jesus spoke this. He said, don't store up the treasures here on earth where moth uh, eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and uh, rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. He's saying like, hey, your money is tied to your heart. And I, I want you to get that this morning is that money actually displays our motives. Money is actually the one thing in life that kind of uh, takes what's in our minds, our hearts, like, and it, it takes it and, and it puts it on display. It shows people around us what we value, what we want to, you know, invest in, and it reveals where our heart is at. And money's unique because it's the one of the few things that takes that, the internal and it shifts it to the external. And it reveals, it displays the motives. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 6 right here. He's saying, listen, you know, wherever your treasure is, there your desires will, of your heart will be as well. You, you're, you're putting all these things. And so uh, it's a warning. It's a, it, it, it says, hey, be aware of where you're investing and what you're, you're building in this life. And let us not just be focused on building here in the present and the temporary, but let us be focused on building the eternal and building the kingdom of God. And what we're building in the kingdom of God is people. And we're reaching people. And we're seeing lives changed. And Jesus is, is working. And, and, and that, that does not get destroyed by the decay of this earth, but will be gloriously like we'll see it in heaven. Like, I, I think about it like this. When I give and support, like, a missionary, I think about it like this. Like, I'm supporting a missionary, and, and I may never meet the people that are going to hear about Jesus because we supported them. In this life, I may never. But, man, when we get to heaven and all is understood and known and all the things that God knows, like, we have a, revel, a greater revelation of God— Man, I'm, I'm praying that like some people come up to me and they're like, hey, you gave that $10 and I heard about Jesus in Cambodia, you know? And, and, and while, because I'm not storing it up here on earth, I'm storing it up in heaven and uh, I'm looking for that. And so Matthew, Jesus continues in that scripture. He says, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and you'll love the other and you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You can't have a love for both things. So we have to decide in our hearts what our first priority and our first love is, is what Jesus is saying here, is we have to put God first. And, and our tithe, when we give and God calls us to give, it's us putting our trust in God. Now, the Greek word here for money is actually mammon. It, the, the Greek word in the original language is mammon. And this is speaking, and what Jesus is speaking to here is a spirit of mammon. And that spirit of mammon is a worldly desire and love for riches. It's the, probably the most carnal version you can think about of like, I just am greedy and I just want money and I'm just building this life and that's the only thing that matters and nothing matter, matters at all. And what he's calling out here is he's like, you will be enslaved by that your whole life if you live that way. And I think it should be a warning to us and all the things I'm talking about with our culture and how things are presented and, and we're marketed to and it's easy to buy this and build up more and, and we feel like we're keeping up with the Joneses, you know, I think it could be easy to fall into the trap of like letting the spirit of mammon grip our hearts and that we become then enslaved to it. 
No one necessarily comes enslaved like willingly, but it's like you just slide into it. You just get caught up in it. You're, you're going after the next thing. But when we give to the Lord, it, it puts our hearts in check. It puts things in the right order. And God calls us to tithe. And you might not even know what that word means. It's not like one we use. It's not like you go to the store and they ring you up and they're like, yep, that's a tithe today. <laughs> tithe is actually... Uh, it just means 10%. It means that God calls every one of us as a step of obedience to give the first fruits of what we earn in 10%. Like we give that 10% as a step of trusting him and to keep our hearts in check. It goes all the way back to before the, uh, the covenant or before the uh, 10 commandments, before the like, Abraham, like it goes all the way back to the early covenant and, and predates. So it's not just Old Testament, it's Old Testament into the New Testament. We'll talk about in coming weeks some of the arguments or people, you know, have things they say that, well, this is not why I tithe or whatever. Or there's, there's logic or things or they think the, theologically the Bible lays it out. But I, I think you'll, you'll see it throughout this series that the Bible makes it pretty clear that from the beginning to the end, God calls us to trust him and put our first fruits in his hands. Uh, and he's asking for 10% of our income to be given back to the Lord. Now, the beauty of this is the 10% is the same regardless of where you are at on the income spectrum. It doesn't matter if you make the least or the most. The 10% is the same for, the, for those that are, that are struggling or just getting by to those that are, uh, have this abundance in life. And the 10% is what God calls us back to give it back to him, and God asks us to honor him. This is what Malachi chapter 3 says. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven and armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you, and I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. See, God's saying, listen, just... Put me first and see what could happen. Put me first and see what is possible. So tithing puts God first in our lives and keeps us dependent on him. And, and when we're dependent on him, we're trusting him as our supply. And it keeps us, our hearts in check. And we don't fall into this temptation. Or we don't fall into this spirit of mammon that we just get so consumed in our lives with you know, building this earthly wealth that we miss out on the opportunities to build the kingdom of God and be generous people and, and see God work in our lives and provide in our lives. I can't tell you how many times in our lives, Jamie and I, in, uh, you know, starting out, we, we've been in ministry for 21 years and, and I can't tell you how many times we did not have a lot, but we were faithful to give and God provided every single time. Like every single time he paid, uh, uh, he, he helped us, he, he paid the bill, he helped us get by. And it's, and it's not always just from your abundance. It's actually a step of obedience that we see that God has a different economy and he can provide and help you get by. He, if you just trust him, you just trust him. I, uh, just a couple weeks ago, a family right here in our church just shared the story with us of what they've walked through over the past couple years and that they walked through, uh, they, they took a step, the, the wife just took a step to stay home and work from home. She took a pay cut, but her husband's job was, was uh, filling in the gap that, that they were, uh, that, that, that was caused by her staying home, but just felt led to stay home. And, and, uh, and then they kind of, you know, uh, stepped into a home and, and, and things were moving forward. And all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, her husband loses his job. And when, she, when he lost his job, it was a blind side. They just felt like the rug got pulled out from underneath them and they were struggling and, and thinking, okay, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it? And I, I know any of us in that situation would have all of those worries and anxieties right off the bat. Like, oh no, what am I going to do? You know, you're suddenly going on LinkedIn as quick as possible, you know, updating your profile. You're, you're like applying on all the websites for every job and, and what, it, what is possible. 
And I love this. They were just sharing this testimony that as they walked through the season, one of the first things they did was they declared that they would not give up tithing, that they had had a moment years earlier that they had kind of gone all in and trusted God in tithing, and that in the midst of their loss, their job loss, that they were not going to give up tithing. And as long as they had money in the, their, their uh, account, they would tithe and then pay their bills. And people were just, you know, as they shared this with what the people are in their life and the job loss, and they said, well, hey, you know, in, the, in their human understanding and logic, they're like, well, it's okay, you could probably defer your mortgage for a season, and, and you can get by and, you know, uh, you know, put this bill off and put that bill off. And, and the testimony of what they walked through is not only did God eventually provide a job, but through that entire season where they were in this transition and lost this job and financially vulnerable, God provided for them every step of the way. And God helped them pay every bill, not a single late payment, and they, they, they tithe every step of the way. I thought, man, that is powerful. I love that. And the, I'm going to quote this. This is what they said. When you've seen what God can do, you realize you, can af- you can't afford not to tithe thought, man, I've seen that play over and over in my life. It's like, what can God do with what you put in his hands and you trust him with? So our faith, our faith and trust has to be in God. So money displays our motives. The second thing I want you to get is that money should be stewarded. Now, the reason I say that is because it shifts from an ownership mindset to it's a stewardship mindset. We are trusting God for what he has. And I remember when Jamie and I first got married, like we would sit down and, and this was maybe probably some of the early days of our, our uh, marriage and we'd just sit down and try to figure out the budget. And it could be a little bit stressful to figure out a budget. Has anybody ever set a budget? You know, there's two people in the world, those that are like loving the budget and maybe it's two people in every marriage. Like God lines it up like this. There's the person that loves the budget. They have the spreadsheet maybe, or they have it written down somewhere. And then there's the person that's like, I never want to look at a budget in my life, you know? And uh, you might have one or the other in in your marriage or, you know, if you're both in one category, like more power to you. Maybe if you're both budget people, like you guys are rocking it, okay? Like if you're both not budget people, like this is for you. This part right here is for you, okay? Like you should have a budget in your life. Like, and I remember when Jamie and I, we'd sit down and like talk about the budget and she would like get so stressed out. And I was like, what are you, why are you stressed out? Like, we're just talking about where we want our money to go and what we could like do with it or should do with it. And she was like, no, I just want to be able to like spend it. I don't ever want, I could want to just show up and then like, I don't want to have any restraints, you know? And, uh, and uh, we used to laugh like, and, and it was kind of something to work through because of just, she never talked about it growing up. My parents like gave me a budget when I was a teenager and I had to like do it. Like, so I, I kind of had a different upbringing than her. And, and so she would almost shut down and then, uh, and kind of just get like frustrated. I'd be like, what, what, we're just talking about the budget, you know, but she just felt like I was like not letting her spend any money, you know. And still today, she just wants to spend. She doesn't care. Like, do we have enough? Is it in the budget? Let's go for it. Okay. So, uh, but God gives us the, uh, an understanding. He gives us the intellect and the insight to be able to budget. That's what Proverbs reminds us of. It says this in Proverbs 27. Know the state of your flocks and put your heart, uh, your heart into caring for your herds. For riches don't last forever and the crown might not be... Uh, may not be passed to the next generation. Now, we're not dealing in herds today, but in, in, in the Old Testament, they, that was the measure of wealth was your, you know, how many goats you had. You know, how many, maybe there's a few people in here in Indiana that have a few goats or, you know, you're, you're measuring your wealth in livestock. So I don't want to exclude you, but I'm saying probably most of us are, are not dealing in, with livestock or herds like this. But in the Bible time, it's saying, listen, care for them. Know what's going in. Know what's coming out. Know the state of it. And so God has given us this understanding that we can, hey, we can, 
know how to set a budget, and then we can live by it, and we can have a plan. And so God wants us to steward what he's putting in our hand. And we look at him as the owner of everything and that we're just stewarding what he's put in our hand. That really will shift your mentality away from this is mine and I have to give it away. No, you're, you're living life open-handed and you're saying, God, like whatever is yours, you're putting, whatever you're putting in my hand, it's yours. And I'm going to let it flow in and flow out. And I'm going to know what's going in and going out. I'm going to keep a budget. I'm going to, I'm going to apply myself. I'm going to take care of it. And I want to steward it well. That is a principle God calls us to. Now, let me just like give you a little bit of math here. Now, in Indiana, the average income is $61,944. Okay? So if you think about this, in your lifetime, you will have a fortune that comes through your hands. You know, some of you are like on a hope and prayer of trying to play the Powerball. But let me tell you, the fortune is like God's putting it in your hand in your job and your career, and you can steward it and manage it well. And if, you, if we just took that average and we said, okay, if you earned that, say, for 30 years, 30 years you earned that amount, you would, in those 30 years, and I even, so I'm taking off, you guys that are like 20-somethings, and you're like, I got no money, I don't make that much, you know, like, let me just, I'll take off 10 years. So from 35 to 65, in 30 years, you will have $1.8 million come through your hands, you know. Uh, but now it gets like a little more staggering if we just looked at Hamilton County where we live right here. Because the average income in Hamilton County is $104,858. Like, wow. Like, wow. So that means that 3.1 million in 30 years will come through your hands. So what a challenge that God gives us, and he gives us the ability to steward it. See, we're the richest 1% on this earth. We are. We're the richest 1%. You see, 70% of the world lives on $10 a day. Some of us don't make it past breakfast at $10 a day. But 15% of the world only lives on $2 a day. So you'll manage a fortune in your lifetime, and God calls us to be stewards of it. This is what Proverbs uh, 24, verses 3 through 4 says, A house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious, precious riches and values. So listen, God calls us to steward it and that it's coming through our hands and we can trust him and he's given us the ability and he's given us that good sense. And let me tell you, if you're not in a healthy place, I want to encourage you to step into something that we offer here at Highmark called Financial Peace University. Dave Ramsey and the Ramsey Solutions, they for years have been helping people get debt-free and get healthy in their finances. So if things are out of whack with your finances, we decided years ago as a church, there is a fee for you to go through Financial Peace University. And we as a church decided years ago that we will pay that fee for you to go through financial peace. So here's what I want you to do. If you're saying, hey, I, I maybe need to figure out a budget. I need to get a plan. I need to understand money a little bit differently or better. Um, I would encourage you to go through financial peace because it is going to help you uh, pay down debt, get a budget. It's going to help you understand things about insurance and things like that um, that are just going to put you in a healthy place. You're never going to be wealthy unless you first start out to get healthy. And God wants us not to be living in the stress of finances. He wants, to live, he wants us to live in this peace. So all you have to do is text that word in yellow, FPU, in the year 2023, to 94,000. And we will give you access to Financial Peace University free of charge, okay? We want you to be healthy. And hear me on this. Don't let pride keep you from fixing something that is broken in your life. And I've seen that happen. People that are too prideful to get help and they have faced disaster. And what I'm saying is before it's too late or before you're at the disaster point, just get some help. All of us need help in all different areas of our lives. This is just one of them. So take a step. Get healthy. Get holy in your finances. And, uh, and 
step into trusting God with the 10%. I'm going to ask uh, some people to help me on stage. I want to kind of close with this illustration today. And I want to illustrate the fact that God calls us not just to give 10%. He calls us to give the first 10%. If you can come up on stage, please. Thank you. Um, if you can come up on stage, that will, that will just help everyone to see. And uh, as you, they come up here, they each have the 10%. So God calls us um, to give the first 10%. And the, we, we needed a lot of people here today. So squeeze in. We need you guys all real close. Come on down here. Come on down here. Get in here. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay, so God calls us to give the 10%. And the 10% is is the first 10%. From the Old Testament, God said, bring the first fruits, bring the first gift. Why? Because that is where faith is. Faith is in the first. It's not in the last. So I think our mentality sometimes is like, well, I'm going to go down here and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give at 10 Uh, after I've paid everything and done everything off, but there's no faith in 10. There's faith in one. There's faith in one and saying, God, I'm going to give you this first tenth and I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of the rest. And and, and when we do that, we're trusting God and putting our our faith in him that we're going to be able to to do the rest. And we know like, you know, you know, if we get God the first to first 10%, we know, uh, you know, the government's taking two and three and four, and we maybe need to pray more three and two, but you know, it's where it's somewhere in there. And then, you know, like we're living, we got expenses and you know, how many people know you're not given the 10% here in the middle. You know, you're like, you're at the point where you're like, they took that. And you know, I remember when my kids, like they got their first job, they opened their paycheck. They're like, what's FICA? You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, it's evil, you know, like, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, and it was just like a, a fun moment as a dad just to be like, well, let me tell you, you know, like, um, and, but you know, you got like bills and things in here. And then what happens is like, you know, you, 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 you budget in some things of fun or whatever. And then you get to the 10. If you, when you get to the 10, then a, a lot of times you, you waited down here. And how many people know there's not 10 left? There's not 10 left. There's probably just a, a little bit of a fraction here and less than 10. And I'm going to just pull out a marker here because I'm going to write on this three because the average Christian gives 3%. And, and it's because when we do that, we're, we're waiting till the very end. And, and then that's just all that's left. And we haven't trusted God from the very start in the very beginning. So God wants us to give uh, at the first fruit and the first 10 because there, that's our trust and that's our faith. And that's saying, God, you are our supply and you're gonna help me then be a better steward of the rest of this. Like, I'm gonna live by that budget. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a, a plan in place and God, I'm gonna wait for you to bless me or open the opportunity, open the door. So uh, God wants us to do the first not the 10, because the first is where there's faith. And our faith is what we live by. God calls us to live by faith, not by sight. So that's where we trust him. Give it up for these people right here. Thank you all for helping us right there. They did a phenomenal job. You know, God wants us to live trusting him. He wants us to live focused on him. I think of just a few weeks ago, I, I was sharing uh, a, mes- a message about Zacchaeus's life, and he was a man that encountered Jesus on a path. And I love the response that Zacchaeus had because he encountered Jesus, and then he gave. It says he gave half of his wealth, more than God would ever call us to, to do, but he gave half of his wealth. And I thought his heart was, it was so cool because his heart was moved by God. And I, I'm just reminded that we, God doesn't want us to live in comparison he wants us to live in trust, and he wants our heart to be moved by the things that moves him, moves his heart. And so comparison actually steals our contentment, while confidence in God will grow our contentment. So we just trust him for everything. So here's my challenge to you. Test God, just like it says in Malachi chapter 3. Test him and see what he could do. Now, practically, 
I'll just say, just make a declaration and go for it. Sometimes people are like, hey, do I need work into it? The tank, you know, go, this month I'm going four, five, six, seven. I just say, make a declaration and go for it. Get serious about it. And let your heart be stirred by what God wants, what, where God wants you to live and how he wants you to live life. He doesn't want you to live with this chaos and anxiety and worry that all hinges based on this world's economy but he wants you to trust him that he's got a plan in his own economy. And when we get outside of, outside of that, then we find contentment because our confidence in God is just growing.